the carnivore diet is becoming very popular all over the world. And many doctors have concerns about a carnivore diet. And I thought you guys would really enjoy today. Uh, this is my special guest. It's not the first time he's been on the channel. Uh, Dr. Tony Hampton from the Chicago, Illinois area. Welcome back, Dr. Hey, man, it's my pleasure. It's been a, a good day in Chicago, a little colder than I'd like it to be. So hopefully it's a little warmer where you're at. And uh, maybe one day me and my wife will uh, find ourselves in the South where the weather is much nicer than it is in Chicago, my friend. Yeah, you two are welcome to the farm anytime, especially your wife. I mean, you can come to it if you want. Uh, but we'd love to host you guys here and take you on a tour. That'd be amazing. So uh, people don't realize you, you're a board certified family that's right right that's right family doctor uh i did uh some additional training in obesity medicine and i went crazy and decided to get a master's in nutrition and functional medicine because that type of approach helps us understand the root cause of why we get sick and they don't teach us any of this stuff in medical school so i say you know what let me become metabolically uh competent let me let me understand why people get sick in the first place and that approach has allowed me to help people heal and obviously spread that message through uh, my podcast, Protecting Your Nest, YouTube, et cetera. So it's been wonderful to become a healer versus a doctor who manages disease. So it's been it's been awesome, my friend. Yeah. And many people complain that doctors just don't have much training in nutrition. And so to answer that complaint, you decided to go back and get your master's in nutrition. So nobody can accuse you of that. Tell us That's a little right. about that. Well, I, I, I studied with the uh, University of Western States and I particularly uh, studied with them because they had this functional medicine component. And what I love about functional medicine, and they have this functional medicine tree, and the tree are the roots of the various reasons why we get sick. In fact, when I came up with my Protecting Your Nest podcast, the NEST and the ROPE acronym really speak to what are the root causes of why we get sick, the nutrition, the lack of exercise, not getting enough sleep, having too much stress, recovering from trauma. So many of my patients come to me and I'm, I'm talking about keto and carnivore and they're like, doc, you don't understand. I, I've been traumatized when I was 15, uh, when my parents died or whatever it was, and they can't focus on diet. So so taking those principles and the rope talks about relationships. We're both married. Our wives have met each other. Healthy relationships are really important. Then, it would, then, it, then avoiding organisms and pollutants that harm us. And the last thing is focusing on protecting our emotions and making sure our life experience is service. So by doing all of those things, when I see a person in front of me and I'm trying to teach this ideal of low-carb keto or carnivore, it's easier to help problem solve what's going on by knowing what to focus on. So they may be doing great with the diet, but then they have a relationship issue. So I'll make sure they get a counselor or they may be having issues with uh, their emotions or they may be having issues with something as simple as they need to move more. So, and although we don't focus on exercise in the beginning, we also know that they need to address those issues. And that's really important because so many people <clears throat> struggle. Rather than rural Tennessee or in, on the south side of Chicago, it could be a single mom who's struggling because she's working two jobs on the night shift and she doesn't have the resources to help take care of her babies and take care of those two jobs. So if I'm going to be a really good doctor, I can't just focus on one thing. I have to focus on why people struggle, giving them grace. And when they struggle, say to them, struggle is normal, but like a cloud, it's going to come into your life and it's going to pass by. My job is to hold their hand and support them while they're struggling so that they don't feel like they're all alone. And I think all clinicians have to do that. Rather, it's learning motivational interviewing so they don't know how to talk to people with dignity and respect and or understanding that the root cause of their problem is not because they have a medicine deficiency, it's because they have a a dietary issue or because they don't move their body or they have too much stress or they're not getting enough sleep. So those are the things I like to focus on, Ken. Yeah, I love that. And uh, I've got a deep, dark secret to reveal about Dr. Hampton here today in front of everybody. Uh, Dr. Hampton used to follow a plant-based diet. 
And he, he believed in his heart of hearts that that was the healthiest diet to follow. And I'm sure, like me, he used to recommend that to his patients. Talk to us about your evolution as a healthcare provider from back when you thought plant based was the way. What kind of what happened in your journey? So now that you're recommending this meat based, if not carnivore, for most people. That's right. So uh, it's a big evolution. First of all, I want to uh, apologize to uh, my patients who I've misled thinking that that was the uh, best way to heal. I thought it was until I stopped going down that wrong, that, that plant-based rabbit hole. And I want to apologize to my wife. My wife's name is Karan. She's a pharmacist. And I apologize for putting in front of her what maybe smelled okay, but a tofu steak. Could you imagine feeding your family a tofu steak? Uh, I want to apologize for uh, having her eat these uh, plant-based burgers for all those years. I thought that that was the way to heal. And, and, and the reason why we started our journey is because I've suffered personally from uh, an irritable bowel problem. And when I shifted from the standard American diet to a plant-based diet, I did feel better initially, which I think a lot of people would argue when they go plant-based. However, the bloating didn't go away. The, and, and here we go, uh, apologizing to my wife, the gas didn't go away. Imagine having to, you're afraid to go to bed because you're worried about gas because of the plants causing all that irritation. So I had bloating, gas, abdominal discomfort, and, and not to mention some nights I was in the bathroom with diarrhea. So I didn't want to live this way. And if I were to personalize this a little bit more, Ken, uh, imagine, and I've shared this story before, imagine going to your graduation for medical school and you're, you're sitting in your chair and you hear your stomach grumbling. Uh, you have to get from, up from your chair and you go to the bathroom and you're praying that you get from the bathroom back to your seat before they call your name. And guess what happened, Ken? They called my name and I wasn't there. <laughs> now, the good news is when they passed me up and, and I wasn't there, they were able to, there was 10, I think it was about 10 people left before I made it back to my seat and I was able to walk that stage. But I do not want to live that way. Do I, I don't want anybody else to live that way. And unfortunately, the plant-based dietary pattern did not serve me well. So I was plant-based probably for about uh, eight years or so. I've been low-carb for 11 and probably carnivore for a little bit over a year. And when I transitioned, every time I went from the low-carb to keto, to ketovore, which is what Nisha does more so, and then I never, I never really hit my comfort zone until I went carnivore. And the reason why I think that's true is because you eliminate all the irritating uh, effects of fiber. You, you eliminate all of the, the anti-nutrients and all the things that plants have that your body just doesn't like. And I probably had a little bit of a leaky gut. And the irony is that I didn't learn anything about a leaky gut until I got my master's in nutrition. I never learned anything about that. And because I didn't learn that, I didn't know how to help my patients. So sometimes this is anecdotal, but sometimes it takes a little anecdotal evidence. And then you find somebody like yourself on YouTube who's spreading this message. And that'll give us all the courage to try new and different things. And, and, and because of your inspiration, that's why I'm doing YouTube and podcasts so I can spread that message. There's not enough people spreading this message. And I still feel like a little bit of an outlier. But knowing that we have a community out there uh, that's supporting this way of thinking is really wonderful. And this is how you heal. So I'm really uh, motivated, particularly as we move forward, to help as many people as possible. Absolutely. And you, what you just said echoes my feelings as well. My first few years of medical practice, I gave terrible nutrition advice. There's no doubt I harmed people with my nutrition advice, uh, even though it was the standard medical nutrition advice uh, right. you know eat more plants eat less red meat avoid bacon avoid saturated fat move more join the gym eat less that didn't help anybody and so no. uh, I, you like and me and many other people in this space the reason we're on youtube is trying to undo the damage that we did trying to make up for, trying to atone for the damage that That's we right. did over our years of medical practice eating idiotic nutrition advice to our patients, patients who trusted us, who looked up to us, who followed what we said blindly. That's right. 
And I, know, I remember early in my career, I would think the people aren't listening to me because obviously they're not, you know, they're, they've gained weight since their last visit six months ago. They're not listening to me. Well, it turns out they weren't listening to me. They were following my advice. It just didn't work. And so I'll spend the remainder of my life on this planet proclaiming a proper right. human diet. And but it's not just you, back in interaction with We'll it's not around. just you. It's 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 not just you inspiring the people in this virtual world. I think that other people are listening. So rather it's what you do, rather it's what someone like Nina Teichels or Dr. Eric Westman, uh, they can't argue with science. And so when you think about the the American Diabetes Association finally saying, you know what, this low carb diet actually works. Uh, and they actually now at least make it a dietary option. The fact that the Association of Clinical Endocrinology, imagine endocrinologists. I just had an endocrinologist on my podcast. Imagine endocrinologists who are now saying, oh, it's okay to do low carb. And then right. what really blew our mind is when the American Heart Association uh, this past year said that not only is low carb okay, but you need to be cautious if you do keto. And, and when they said that, you're thinking, well, what's this caution about? And the reason why they said that is because it's the most effective diet. So you need medical guidance to help you de-prescribe medications, which most doctors are not trained to do. So you can get off your medicine safely because other than fasting, it's the most effective diet to help people uh, lose weight, reverse diabetes, get off their blood pressure medicine, and then reduce their risk for things like dementia, which is called type 3 diabetes, by the way, and their risk for cancer. And we already know now that cancer is a metabolic disease. It's the Warburg effect. And so if that's all true, then we need to teach our doctors how to do this. We need to have a metabolic specialty. We're, we've been blessed that the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners now has a journal. So now we can actually share articles and research with our colleagues because they're not going to follow the the youtuber like dr ken barry or dr hampton what they're going to do is they're going to follow the guidance of the standard organizations and although that's going to put them in the wrong direction sometimes we need to then create journals and organizations that also understand metabolic health and by doing that now the healing can begin and that's really why i'm excited about the future so i was not as excited five years ago but since I'm starting to see some, we're getting a little headway. I think we're going to be able to make a big difference, Ken. I totally agree. And like Liz's doctor, for example, her doctor doesn't know that there was actually a head-to-head -head trial of a ketogenic diet That's versus right. the DASH diet. And the ketogenic diet lowered blood pressure better than the DASH diet, which is the diet recommended by the American Heart Association specifically to lower blood pressure. That's right. Keto works better than the DASH diet, but Liz's doctor doesn't know yet because they haven't seen me or you on YouTube they, and no. they haven't read any of the articles. They just don't know that article exists because I'm sure that doctor would go, wait, what? They wouldn't, they wouldn't, do this. They wouldn't believe it. You'd have another woke doctor. It, and I have, I have my uh, keto handouts on my, uh, you know, like where I discharge my patients and I'm teaching that, but literally right next to it, are my other colleagues hand out because the standard of care is the dietary approach to stop hypertension, uh, which is the DASH diet. Now, the good news is this just came out in June. They didn't get the memo yet, but this is the good news. It wasn't just effective for reducing your blood pressure. It was twice as effective, by the way. It was three times effective keto versus DASH of uh, putting that diabetes into remission type two. And it was twice as effective for weight loss. We've always known that keto was the best diet for weight loss, but to see a head-to-head -head trial, Ken, was very important to put that in front of people because the doctors will only fi fi follow the science. What we have to do is to get them not just follow the science, but it needs to be those quality studies, randomized controlled trials. And what's gotten us into a ton of trouble over the years are these observational studies. And unfortunately, so much of nutritional resources based on these obs observational studies that only show possible correlation, possible uh, correlation and association, but does not show causation. So, so we have to distinguish. And even if we have a study that's carnivore, if it's observational, we got to call it out and say, we need more research. But if we don't have any other studies, then we can then put a little bit more faith in that until we get additional research. So 
I'm, I'm excited yeah. about the future. And what many people don't realize, including most doctors and dietitians, is that a plant-based diet is a bad diet. It has never been shown to even have strong association with, with improved health. It, it, all the studies show a hazard ratio or an odds ratio of 1.8, 1.2, right. which is not even as, that's background noise. That literally, you shouldn't even publish that study. You should be embarrassed. You're like, well, that thing. I guess I need to look at something else. Another big fad that's coming back again uh -oh. is the blue zones. Oh, oh my God. The, the people in the blue zones eat only beans and rice and they live to be 150 years old. Let's talk about the Blue Zones for a minute because it's becoming very popular again. There's just a documentary series on Netflix. I'm sure there's more books coming. Uh, what's the science behind this Blue Zone? At coming, you got a master's degree in nutrition. I'm sure that their science is solid recommending the Blue Zone diet. Uh, do we even know what that is? And, yeah. and then is it real? What the heck's going on with the Blue Zones? Oh, my God. It's... Um... It's, it's actually nice to know that there's this idea of you find a place where the centenarians, and in other words, people who live to 100, it's a place where those folk, uh, in theory, live to an advanced age. And, and if you think about that, that's a really good concept. So Dan Buettner uh, came up with this idea and, and and it's really important that you understand that it's really an observational, it's observation. So he went there and I do appreciate the fact that he went there and he observed what was going on with the people there. So uh, first of all, the blue zones, uh, I have a way to remember uh, my wife uh, who you met, Karan and my oldest son came up with a mnemonic and it was uh, entitled, Oh No Lord, I've Sinned. So not to make fun of Dan Buettner, but the O is for Okinawa, Japan. That's a blue zone. The N is for Nicoya, Costa Rica. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, there's a Loma Linda, California that's in that mnemonic. There's a, a Icaria, Icaria, Greece, and, and Sardinia, Italy. So the mnemonic will help you remember that. But why did I make fun of Dan Buettner about that? Well, because Dan Buettner gives you the impression. So if you watch the Blue Zones documentary that was or is on Netflix, the, uh, the assumption is that the Blue Zones will work if you eat a plant-based diet, right? So I, I, so I was wondering, is that really true? So what I did, in fact, I uh, recently spoke at one of the conferences that we tend to speak at together. And I think this was the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. So I went to the conference and I, I shared with them that there was a study. So I looked at each blue zones and did my research. And when I did the research for Okinawa, Japan, as an example, um, there was this uh, uh, study that was done and it was basically looking at nutrition in the elderly in Okinawa, Japan. And it was shocking that they found zero vegetarians in that study. So so, so already there's a disconnect. And one thing I find in a lot of the blue zones is that they eat a lot of pork, right? So if anybody was honest, uh, and Dan Buettner's not being honest, don't let's not put out there. If you if you put out a narrative that you think a plant-based dietary pattern is better, you sell that narrative, but you always speak truth to power. Don't you know, cur you know, throw a curveball at us, particularly for people like myself who started a plant-based diet based on the blue zones and maybe the China study, which we can talk about. But if you give me misinformation, first of all, I don't trust you anymore, but more importantly, you're misleading the public. So, and, and then the other example I'll give you is the seven day Adventist. So, uh, I met, you met, um, you met Russ of the um, Homesick Buckeye YouTube channel, right? Yes. And so this is a guy who decided to, you know, go uh, more keto war. And, and I talked to him. I said, Russ, you, you, your family was uh, Seventh-day Adventist. So tell me a little bit about their dietary pattern. He said, essentially, only maybe one out of three are actually plant-based. And that's the narrative is that they're plant-based. And then I looked it up. I actually found uh, a study that talked about it. And shockingly, only 15% of Seventh Day Adventists are vegan, which means that 85% aren't. So this narrative that you have to eat a plant-based diet to be healthy is false on its face. 
just as importantly, we already know that Hong Kong tends to end up in first or second place for uh, longevity. So why aren't they part of the blue zones if they are in first or second place for longevity? That's yeah, because Dr. they don't want to. forgot about Hong Kong, didn't he? Because he they, forgot they, about Hong they, Kong. Almost every year they come in number one for longevity, the longest That's right. citizen. And, and I they think also Iceland. are some of the highest red meat eaters in the whole world. Uh, not only are they the they they every time I look it up, they're the highest, and they eat the equivalent of two steaks per person per day. So you can't say the steaks are bad for you if you have the longest lived country or civilization living the longest. So so all we're asking people to do is to be honest. So if you say to me your dietary pattern leads to longevity, that's okay. But what you can't say to me is that my a uh, dietary pattern doesn't lead to longevity because clearly that's untrue based on the evidence. And I just want people to wake up and be uh, aware that there there may be a couple of ways to achieve the same goal. Uh, there are people out there like uh, Colin Campbell of the uh, of the uh, you know the the, the China study uh, that the largest uh, study ever done, unfortunately observational. He is, he's going to be celebrating 90 years this year. But we also have people like Dr. Richard Bernstein, who will also be celebrating 90 years this year. And guess what? He's a type one person with diabetes who's not having diabetes. Compli- In fact, he's like kind of a role model for my wife who has type one diabetes. And his approach is working perfectly. In fact, that type one grit group on Facebook, if you look at the study they put out there, they took about 316 people with type 1 diabetes with that group and they you know they're following this like kind of a keto dietary pattern i think on average it was 36 or less carbs a day and the average a1c in a typical type 1 person with diabetes is 8.6 which means they're going to lose 12 years of life well in this group it's 5.6 so if 316 random people in a study who follow keto slash carnivore are being successful, then you can be successful. These are regular people. They're not necessarily doctors and nutrition experts who simply change their diet. And now they're able to normalize their blood sugars. They don't have that glycemic variability where it's up and down. And they eat a, a diet that their insulin can more easily match uh, you know, the, the glucose that they need. If you try to match your glucose spike and you're eating a 50 carb meal, good luck with that. It's going to be almost impossible to match it. Therefore, you're going to be on a roller coaster. Rather, you're going to be hypoglycemic, hyper, you're going to feel irritable. And, and we don't want to live like that. In fact, one thing that I learned as I done, did research for my wife, and, and I'm saying this out loud, people who uh, have up and down sugars tend to have poor relationships, tend to have more depression and anxiety. And as much as a good wife my wife is trying to be, and as much as a good husband, if we're dealing with those issues, we're going to struggle. And and if we're going to celebrate another 30 years, we celebrated 30 years this past year, which is shocking, we're going to have to make sure my wife is healthy. So my job and my primary goal, other than being a metabolic health doc, is to walk with my wife so that she is not living on a roller coaster so that 30 years from now, because I don't even have grandkids yet, Ken. So I need some grandbabies. I don't think you have grandkids yet, right? You're going to be a great grandfather. I I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I love kids, by the way, so I can't wait for that day. Yeah, so I think it's important for everybody because, you know, if you watch the Netflix documentary about the Blue Zones, it just seems compelling. And he, you know, he's, he's a, a beautiful spokesperson for this. There's beautiful scenery. But it's important for, for people to realize there's no science that supports that at all. There are many questions about the, even the validity of the blue zones, of the people's age in the blue zones. Many of them didn't have birth certificates. And all of a sudden, there were government, government benefits to be had if you were a certain age. So then magically, a bunch of people were that age. And then they lived like 105, 110. But... It, in all the blue zones, without exception, when they instituted mandatory birth certificates for everybody, you had to document your, your date of birth in order to get government benefits. Mm. All the centenarians disappeared. There's, there's been no new centenarians since they implemented that in, wow. in Sardinia and in uh, Costa Rica. Uh, it's like they just disappeared. 
And then everybody who studied nutrition at all knows that in La Melinda, the vast majority of people are not vegan. No. And, and many of the vegetarians, they include eggs, they include cheese, they include okay. fish, they include dairy, uh, and every time then they'll trip and fall on the stick. And, you know, and so I think the message to take from the Blue Zones is that being very involved in your community is, is healthy. It's good. Well, thing. that's it. I think you, you make a very good point. So I did two videos. One video uh, saying, damn, you know, oh, no, Lord, I've lied, Dan Butner, right? And the other was celebrating, although observational, although not cause and effect, one thing that he did observe is that people in the blue zones, they move naturally. So they don't go to the local gym, but they're always active. So if you want to live longer, I think that's a good idea. Another thing they do is that they they live a life of purpose. So my, my purpose in life is to be the metabolic health doc, take care of my family. And that's my purpose. That's why taking time to do this after a busy morning of video calls uh, with my patients is no big deal because I'm living in my purpose. So I think that's a good stuff. Uh, they also talked about uh, the 80% rule. So, you know, not, you know, I tend to eat until I'm full, but I never overeat. And, and, and they also are comfortable with wine. I'm not a big drinker, but they really talk about community, family first. They have a strong uh, spiritual connection. So I think all of those principles are very important and who you hang with matters. So make sure you have the support of a community like this to support you as you take this journey. Make sure mm -hmm. that people in your life who are not adding value and who are literally uh, you know, saying that you're nuts for doing this, it's okay to keep a relationship, but you may not want to spend as much time with those people. And as you continue to hang with the right people, think a certain way, feed your brain these positive messages, that'll help you overcome those moments of struggle. So, so there are some lessons we can learn from the Blue Zones, but, we, but the thing about Dan Butner, and I'll say this last thing, he knows that they eat meat. He knows that they're not primarily, he has to know this because he was there. And if you, and I've had people who have been in the military that have been in places where they're supposed to be in the blue zones. I've had patients who have visited these places and they say it's almost insane that people would suggest they don't eat meat when they are big time eaters of meat. So I just want us to have an intellectually stimulating conversations while being honest about what we're saying. As long as we can do that, we can still debate what's right and wrong, but we absolutely have to speak truth to power. Absolutely, and, and I think we need to do that persistently, vocally, publicly, and often. Because when you when you call out subterfuge, whether it's intentional or not, it tends to minimize, it tends to go away. Like when you turn on the, the light, the roaches scurry. And I'm not saying everybody who actually a plant-based diet is a roach, but there are roaches in there because they know there's profit to be made. Okay, there's profit uh, selling the food. You can make you can make stuff out of ground up wheat protein and wheat and rice and wheat and corn that'll that, that basically get the commodities free because they're so subsidized by federal government. They're shelf stable for two or three years. You can make them in a factory at scale. Package them up, put them in a box. You can ship them on a boat across the ocean. Like you said, the warehouse for six months, sit on the grocery shelf for three months. If somebody buys them and it's still fresh. That's right. That's yeah, crazy. that's not real food. Real food don't go like that. Okay. Well, when you think about it, like, oil. Yeah. I mean, think about the, um, like, uh, Vinny Tortorich did the uh, Beyond Impossible documentary, and I was in there uh, sharing some perspectives. And again, apologizing to my wife for having her to eat these, uh, you know, <laughs> green burgers, right? But it's even worse than that. Like, I think some of those green burgers at least didn't have a lot of uh, garbage added. And I remember even seeing a video of yours in the past, Ken, where you talked about leg hemoglobin. And, and the leg hemoglobin in the, uh, that, that, that fake burger, you know, was causing... Uh, problems, I think, in the kidneys of mice, right? I, I, uh, so, mm -hmm. so what logical person would think <clears throat> eating this processed food product with a list of ingredients that are so long, half of which even the doctor can't pronounce, is a better way to feed your family 
than eating a real food item like a steak and some, and if you're, you know, eating vegetables, green beans or cabbage, mm. it's not logical, but that's what they'd want you to believe because as you have suggested, maybe there's some profit. Maybe there's, maybe the people who own the land, uh, Bill Gates, uh, are people who are going to benefit from teaching this approach. So we have to use our brains. And the first thing you have to learn when you're making these dietary changes, I don't care if it's plant-based or animal-based, eat real food. Anything in boxes are in general to be avoided. That does not yep. mean that if you <clears throat> take a trip from Chicago to Tennessee, that you don't, if you're a plant-based person, that you don't eat a, a, a fake burger on your way to Tennessee. But if you think you're, the, if you think you're eating health food, you're mistaken. We need to eat real whole foods, shop on the outer portion of the grocery store where the fresh vegetables are. We can do frozen too, and where the, the meat is. And 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 I would even and I would even argue that the fruit can be a problem because the for most of my patients uh, who have metabolic disease, who have diabetes, borderline diabetes, they're gonna yeah. struggle with a banana. They're yeah, gonna let's, struggle. I don't want to talk about that for a second. I think that's very important. Then we got a question from the audience. So what I call this, Dr. Hampton, is the false choice. Mm -hmm. So somebody's eating, drinking Pepsi, eating Cheetos and Doritos and honey buns, and donuts. They know that. They know that's not healthy, right? And then they have a scare. They have chest pain or cure. They have a little stroke, whatever. And now they're like, oh, my God, I'm really not immortal. I, I better step it up. That's right. right? I, better, I better start eating a healthy diet. That's and right. so they replaced the Pepsi and the, and the Cheetos and the Ding Dongs with fruit smoothie and with, with lots of fruits and vegetables. It's always That's fruit right. first, right? And with whole grain bread, they get rid of the bunny bread and start eating whole grain bread with seeds on the top. And they have went out of their way to make these new food choices. They have spent their motivation, their energy, their stamina, their willpower, and their money mm. on all these new healthy foods. And in many cases, you know as well as I do when you check the lab work, they their A1C is just as high on that healthy food. That's their right. insulin level just as high. Their inflammatory markers are just as high. Nothing gets better. And so this is why in my opinion, many patients give up. They're like, screw it. Well, I don't even understand. I, I ate healthy. And there's a recent study that, that shows that uh, imposing a healthy diet they gave money to buy so many meals a week of healthy food. But when you look at the supplemental information, it was fruit vegetables. And yeah, if you see a healthy diet don't really make any difference at all. And that's because that's not a healthy diet. It may be slightly less than healthy than eating the Cheetos, Ding Dong, and Burrito, but that's not a proper human diet. And people just, they don't understand that because they don't have the green nutrients. They haven't made it their life people like me and you to study human nutrition and what actually gives you the most bang for your buck. And they wind up wasting all this time and energy and money on something that's not even making a difference. That's right. Um, it's, it's really uh, disconcerting that uh, very smart people who get an education in nutrition, who get an education to be a clinician, and they they make recommendations and the recommendations don't get the results they expect. So they'll put somebody on the DASH diet and they don't realize that the grains in that DASH diet is going to raise their patient's blood sugar, right? Even the Mediterranean, you can do a Mediterranean, but it better be a low carb Mediterranean because again, the grains are going to raise your blood sugar. So anything that spikes your blood sugar. That's why the meter is such a valuable tool. And for those who get access to a continuous glucose meter, it's such a valuable tool because I could literally say to them, don't, don't, don't believe nothing I say. Here's a continuous glucose meter or a meter, eat something. And if it raises your sugar, stop e eating that thing. Yep. If they do that, by the in three months, when I see them again, they won't be eating anything that's bad for them. So this is not you don't have to trust the experts like me and uh, Ken here. You can just trust that meter. And to me, that's the that's the biggest source of truth. And so, yes, if you grind up fruit, 
fruit's going to raise your sugar. A banana has 28 carbs divided by four, seven teaspoons of sugar. But you put that banana in a blender and you add the berries and all these other things, but it's just a big uh, cup of sugar. If you take a grain and, 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 and consume that, Rather, it's in the form of wheat or quinoa. Quinoa sounds so fancy, you know, Ken. But quinoa has 40 carbs on average. Do you really think that 40 divided by 4, 10 teaspoons of sugar is good for a person with diabetes? The answer is, of course, it's not. The answer is, hell no. Amen. <laughs> so, the, and that's absolutely the truth. And, and literally, you need to say it with emotion because it's very frustrating. So real quick, why is that grain a problem? Why is that, you know, these, these high glycemic fruit are problem? Because it's going to raise your blood sugar. And when that happens, you're going to raise your insulin level. And you're going to be chronically, because they want you to graze all day on this stuff, you're going to be chronically high on insulin. So that's hyperinsulinemia. That's going to lead to insulin resistance where insulin's not working well. And in your blood vessels, that's going to lead to constriction because your body's going to start making the nitric oxide. Most of us know that's how we open our blood vessels up. Your blood vessels make nitric oxide, but when you consume all those carbs and sugar, it's going to stop making that. So you're constricting. You're going to have an influx of calcium constriction. You're going to have the increased intake of salt into your body because Hyperinsulinemia leads to higher salt reabsorption in your kidneys. And lastly, you're going to get inflammation. That's going to culminate in blood vessels all over your body because you got blood vessels everywhere except for a couple of places like the cornea of my eye, the top layer of my skin, maybe in my nails. So that means all my blood vessels are going to be damaged. Now you're not surprised that I end up with uh, blood vessels in my brain causing a stroke or dementia. Now you're not surprised that my pressure is high. Now you're not surprised that my risk for kidney disease because the blood vessels in the kidneys are higher. That's why diabetes and number two hypertension are the number one causes of dialysis. It's all the same disease. The magic of being able to fix that. So you can do one thing. You can say, you know what? I, I don't want to have all that calcium coming to causing constriction. So I'm going to take amlodipine, this calcium channel blocker. Oh, I don't, I don't want to have all that salt. So I'm going to take a, a diuretic and that'll take care of the salt. I don't want to have a problem with, uh, you know, inhibiting nitroglycerin. So I'll just take nitroglycerin. Something's wrong, America. So we're going to literally take the antidotes, which don't get to the root cause, when we could have just simply reduced the carbs in our diet instead of taking all of these pills with side effects and costs. This is not rocket science. This is just common sense. We need to change our health system to one where the clinicians are taught why do they have high blood pressure in the first place? Why do they have diabetes in the first place? Get to that root cause. And by doing that, we'll then avoid all of those expensive medicines. So we're just trying to change the paradigm from disease management to healing and reversal. And that's what this metabolic health message does. That's what keto does. That's what carnivore does. And that's what we're trying to spread to the world. Absolutely. Now, uh, Dr. Hampton and I do have some concerns about a carnivore diet and, and a, a Somebody uh, asked a question. They have a concern. Is there any practical concern with consuming the advanced glycation end products that come as a result of the Maillard effect when searing steak? Now, I, I know my opinion on this. What's your opinion on this, Dr. Man, you know, I I am, uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny because when I uh, eat my steak, uh, it does taste better when it's uh, seared. And uh, and when you do that, and I think that excessive exposure to, uh, you know, glycation. So glycation just means that you're going to add uh, glucose to protein or fat. And, and the advanced glycation end products is kind of an inflammatory uh, reaction where you have oxidation, inflammation, and things like that. If that happens in the arteries, there's problems with the arteries. If it happens around the nerves you may end up with something like a neuropathy. So, 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 so for me, I, first of all, there's levels to this. And for me, I think that that's excessive concern. The, the bigger concern is not the, uh, any reaction that occurs on that steak. It's the, the, the excessive carb load that you put on your body that the glycation is occurring throughout the entire body. So if you assume what I said is true, that, it's the carbs that lead to all the things I described for, uh, you know, insulin resistance and things like that. Well, the same is happening with the the the, the glycation. 
It's happening in your nerves. It's happening in your blood vessels, which is why it's, it becomes kind of a systemic reaction. But yep. listen, when I when I check my set rates and my C-reactive proteins and all these inflammatory markers, when I have my calcium score test, I got a zero. Uh, if it's causing harm, I can't see any evidence of it. So yep. I just don't see evidence that that's true. Uh, yep. and and we don't want to get so anal with this that you're afraid to eat anything. I mean, what are we going to be left with? You're, you're not going to eat the sugar and starch because you're concerned. And you're not going to want to have a delicious steak. So that's kind of my general view of it, Ken. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And so here's my take on advanced lactation in products. First of all, anything that you brown, from toast to rice to vegetables to steak, the Maillard effect is, is going to happen. You're going to have the production of advanced Caucasian end products in that food. It's not just meat. It's any food that you brown. That's number one. Number two, the advanced glycation end products that you eat in your diet are broken down by your stomach acid. They don't just, they're not shoveled straight into your artery. They're broken down. They're completely irrelevant. That's number two. Now, number three, I've always tried to uh, since I started down this nutrition rabbit hole journey of mine, I've tried to also include archaeology, anthropology, paleoanthropology. And so when you start to look at that literature, human beings have been cooking meat over an open fire for at least 3.6 million years. Yeah. So if the AGEs that we produce when we grill a steak, because if any of y'all have ever tried to grill a steak over an open fire, you go get some steering. You're gonna get some time. Yeah. And sometimes you go drop that steak in the pot and have to fish it out. And it's gonna be covered. And you're gonna eat it anyway if you're hungry. And that's what our ancestors did for millions of years. So I'm not worried about advanced vacation in products on my steak at all. Every steak I cook, I sear. That's right. Without exception, whether it's in the skillet or on the grill. Wherever it's at, it's going to be seared because it tastes much better. And I think that's also a hint. Just common sense. Things aren't going to taste that good to you if they're bad for you, okay? Unless it's made in a chemical factory. Then they might be able to trick your taste buds. But if it comes from nature, which meat is the – I was just asking chat uh, GPT this morning, what food have humans been eating the longest of any food? Meat. Yeah. 2.6 million years. The documented 3.6 million years, if not long, right? That's right. So stop worrying about these. I call this a 1% problem. Like, yeah. first of all, you need to eat your meat. Shut up and eat your meat, okay? That's right. Then you can start worrying about learning about all these things because this is just a, a typical scare tactic from plant-based proponents. They want you to be afraid of this, but they don't forget to tell you, oh, well, if you toast your bread in a toast roast, you're going to have a PE. If yeah. you brown your rice, which many ethnicities love to brown their rice and, and put a put sear to it, that's AGEs. That's okay? right. Any, any vegetable that you cook, you roast in the oven, the little brown chips, that's AGEs. That's right. So stop trying to use scare tactics and to scare people away from an ancestrally appropriate food. Let's focus on the big things. We, and also, I just had all my labs checked for my 55th birthday. Nice. And I got I got a CRP, I got a SED rate, I got a, a tumor necrosis factor alpha, I got IL nine, IL six, all of them normal. No, no. And I I live on charred steak, and That's even right. when I cook ground beef, I try to put a little brown to it, right? Because it tastes better. Yeah, it just tastes better. All and my in fact, all and so not just CRP is normal. All of my inflammatory markers, ninety percent of which most doctors don't even check uh, an IL six, IL two, IL nine. Tumor necrosis factor alpha. They don't check that stuff on average people. They they check a CRP, maybe an ESR, maybe not, and that's it. And so you can't tell me I've been eating carnivore for the last five and a half years, and I know I've been on carnivore for years as well. If those HGEs and all those other things that plant based people say, oh, meat's very inflammatory, how are all our inflammatory markers? Working? We literally live on seared steak and, and, and brown meat. How are our markers normal if it's That's so right. I think I think you make one one thing I'm hearing from your message is we have ways to know if you're healthy. We can we can check if we think about the metabolic markers, we got blood pressure, blood sugar, our belly size, and we have triglycerides and HDL. So we got that. You mentioned C-reactive protein, 
Uh, we have, uh, you know, set rates. We have uh, C, C peptides. We have apoprotein B to A ratio. We have lipoprotein small particle A. Uh, we have ways to measure metabolic health. So if you are looking at your triglycerides to HDL ratio, and it's under two, maybe it's one, you're okay. If you did a, a, a heart scan and your score is very favorable, you're okay. But so, so if we find ourselves living in the weeds, you will be so paranoid, it'll drive you crazy. So rather it's how you're eating or how you measure success, that's what I would focus on. And I think the benefits of eating a diet that's animal-based, you've eliminated that non-essential nutrient called carbs. It's essential to have protein and fat. So now the toxins that are in plants are gone. The anti-nutrients that inhibit you from absorbing all these so-called nutrients are gone. You, you, you don't have to worry about your belly anymore because you're gonna use fat as your fuel. So you're gonna have weight loss. You're not going to have to worry about diabetes because your insulin sensitivity is going to be phenomenal because you've allowed the pancreas to rest. I mean, literally people who graze all day, the pancreas can't rest. So don't be surprised if you see peptide ends up at a level where you get type 1 diabetes or is that is that good because you're not resting it. If you have irritable bowel problems like me and you want to heal your gut, what's the best diet to heal your gut? It's an animal. It's that, that seared steak that you just mentioned, Doc. That's what's good for it. What's good for inflammation? An animal-based diet. And if you're a man, for all the guys out there, if you want to have testosterone and libido, and that goes for the ladies too, you need fat in your diet. If you don't have cholesterol and fat, you're not going to make these sex hormones. And the thing that I really love the most, besides not feeling hungry eating this way, is my mind. I have mental clarity that's off the charts because when I finish with Ken today, I have to go and do some stuff on behalf of my wife, uh, my honey-do list. I have more work to do. I I have a a podcast to prepare for for in a couple of days, but my mental clarity is off the chain. If my kids come to me and say, Dad, I got a question about life, I have the mental clarity and the energy and the desire to do those things. So I I literally feel like uh, the movie Limitless. I felt like somebody gave me a pill that's making everything easier. And until you experience that, and and that would be my New Year's request for everybody who hasn't tried this. Do an experiment. Give it, do a challenge. I know you guys do challenges. Do a 30-day challenge. Do an experiment and say, you know, for 30 days, I'm going to try this. And if you find that you feel better after 30 days, you may want to go another 30 days. That's how I ended up at Carnivore. Guys like Dr. Barry challenged us. And I say, you know what? I like Dr. Barry. He seems pretty smart. Let me try this and see what happens. And and I thought I was doing pretty good with keto. My stomach said, no, you can do better, Tony. You can do better. And when I started doing better, I stopped noticing that I had a stomach. What a good feeling, you know, going back to when I was at my graduation, to know that if I got to speak at, uh, we spoke at Keto Palooza and, 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 uh, and the other keto <laughs> event, right? And and what happens is when you get on that stage, if you have a stomach problem, it's not going to cooperate. Well, I don't have to think about that no more. And that's that's right. how I want to live. And it's such a, a good feeling to actually get your body back and to and to have that clarity. So I really think if there's a risk in this diet, I haven't seen it. Yes, I agree completely. And for, for people listening who never had a gastrointestinal issue. It can, it can ruin your life. It can ruin your life, control your life. Anybody out there with irritable bowel, uh, either di- uh, diarrhea predominant or constipation dominant, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, any of the gut issues. I used to have severe heartburn. It was so bad. I took two necks in a day, doc. I got all the samples. The other patients got them. But it affected my ability to speak. And as a doctor, right. that's kind of what I do for a living. I was having to right. swallow, clear my throat get my esophagus right before I could say a sentence. And people don't, just don't realize, so many of you guys, if you have any kind of gut issue from this opening to the other opening, try 90 days of carnival, beef, butter, bacon, and eggs. It's that yeah. simple. If you're hungry, you eat, you eat until you're full. Then you stop eating and don't eat again until you're truly hungry again. That's it. You don't have to weigh, measure, track, nothing. 
eat meat and eggs, when hungry, eat till full, stop eating, and then repeat that. And within 90 days, and for some gut conditions, much sooner than 90 yeah. days, but some are going to take a little longer. You're, you may never leave carnivore because you might be like, oh, my God, the freedom that I have from my colon dating, how many times I got to stop on the way to work, how close I have to sit to the bathroom in the restaurant, uh, can I get up on stage? I don't know about I don't know if today's the day. Maybe I need to reschedule this. Mm -hmm. You're free, the freedom from that. Because people want to talk about how restrictive carnivore is. I don't feel restricted at all. I don't feel restricted at all. I feel liberated. Yeah. By a carnivore diet because of the freedom it allows me and you able to just jump up on stage and not be like, where's that bathroom at in case I need it? Right. You don't have to worry about that food because now your gut just does its job and sits there quietly. It's not dictating your life anymore. Now, Doc, I know you practice in the Chicago area. There's a subset of the population in the United States that suffers great from, from either diagnosed type 2 diabetes, pre-diabetes, hyperinsulinemia, or undiagnosed. Mm -hmm. they, they have to go on dialysis center. They're six times more likely to lose a toe or a foot or a leg, right? They are uh, three or four times more likely to suffer from retinopathy and go blind. Now, who am I talking about here? Let's, let's talk to this community for a while because I feel like they don't get this message. Somehow it's not, it's not filtering to them. They don't, I don't know if they don't trust the medical society and any doctor talking on YouTube. Part of that's not listening to him. I don't know what's going on there, but I feel like that if anybody can benefit from the carnivore diet in this community. Yeah. There's, there's, there's certain populations who trust the health system. And you wouldn't know that because you kind of think we're all cynical. Well, not necessarily. I think people have to trust somebody. And uh, are they going to trust the YouTuber? Are they going to trust their their clinician, their doctor, the advanced practice clinician? And so what I find is that in most cases, there's trust there. There may be, like people think that, particularly in communities of color, that there's this uh, lack of trust. And I think that that's a real thing because those communities don't get a fair shake sometimes. Yep. But they just want somebody who will hear them and whatever advice they're giving, they'll probably follow. So what I try to do to reach people is, and it kind of starts with that nest and rope acronym, nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, uh, relationships, avoiding organisms and pollutants that harm us, protecting our emotions and making sure our life experience is service, right? What that does is that when people come to me and I give them my keto or low carb handout, and for some people, that's all they need, right? And if that's not what they need or there's a barrier, then what I do is I say, well, let's figure out my job as a doctor is to not make them the doctor. I need to figure out what's wrong with them. They're paying me a copay so I can figure it out. So so what I do is I then start to dive a little deeper and I'll start looking at, well, maybe life is too stressful and then I need to work on that. Or maybe they're not getting enough sleep and I give them tools for that. Maybe the relationship is not where it needs to be. And we may do a therapist or a, a, a relationship coach. So that's kind of like the first thing I do. The next thing I do, and particularly in this community where I work, I say, well, there are some economic issues that other communities may not have. And what I had to learn talking to you and others, these same economic issues occur in rural America. This is not just a, a big city issue. There's a plenty of people in this country who are struggling, living on uh, you know, a, a Walmart's wage, which is probably not going to take care of the, the bills. So I look Correct. at the economics and say, is the person in front of me able to even pay for a medicine if they're using it for bridge therapy or pay for the cauliflower that I want them to use for mac and cheese instead of the pasta, right? So I have to think about that. The other thing I have to think about is, can they even get to my clinic easily? Can they even, do they have the resources to do a video visit in the way that I want them to? Or the support, if they're an 85 year old, maybe they just can't figure out how to use the, uh, this happened today in my clinic. There was an older patient and my medical assistant just couldn't quite get it done because she didn't have a younger family member to help her. If I say to them low carb, 
or a keto or metabolic anything, will they even know what the heck I'm talking about? So you have an education issue. So I need to make sure that I speak to them in a way they relate and they understand. And on the South side of Chicago, we have food deserts. So are they able to even go to the local, local grocery store? And we started our food pharmacy where we give out food every other week uh, uh, in our hospitals and at some of the churches. We, we literally had to you know, talk to the grocery stores about, you know, the food they have and say, we promise we'll get people in there if you would get some fresh food in there. Uh, But more importantly, we realized that the people in the community, they needed a way to get access to uh, fresh food. So we started a food pharmacy and we're growing that within Advocate Health uh, in the, in the Midwest and hopefully in the South region as well. But, but, but other things that are important are a sense of, you know, can I, can I take a walk in my community and feel safe? Right. So if I'm stre- chronically stressed because I can't take a walk in my community, you think that's going to affect your blood sugar? You think that's going to affect your blood? Pre- absolutely. And, and the last thing is just having access to people like me. There's not a love. If, if I went to the diet doctor's website or the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners website, uh, do you think they're going to find a lot of Dr. Hamptons on those websites? The answer is no. In fact, doc, I want to do a shout out to you. Because literally yesterday, I had two patients who came to me. Uh, their names were Carlos and Ingrid uh, Carcamo. I saw them just yesterday. And they found me because they found you first. And they say, you know what? We saw you uh, having a conversation with Dr. Kim Berry. And we wanted to come see you. But, but, they, but they had to, you know, you have to literally search for uh, people like that. And I also have another patient I saw today who's a big fan. Uh, Rick and his wife, Melanie um, uh, Saxenger, I think that's their last name. They, I want to do a shout out to them because literally you can't even find doctors like me and you. And so, uh, so, so we want to have doctors who don't just understand metabolic health. We want doctors who will see the person in front of them as an individual who may struggle. In fact, we expect them to struggle. Our job is to help them and walk with them when they struggle. And if we do that, it won't, I won't have to point my finger and say, you didn't try hard enough. They, nobody wants to be unhealthy, but they right. have so many barriers to being healthy and it is not their job. They're, they're going to have to partner with us and they do have to be accountable. But ultimately, we're supposed to be the experts. We're supposed to know how to help fix them. And then we give them the right information, not a DASH diet. We give them the right diet that's going to help them heal. And then with that, then we can see them make the progress. So I think that hopefully we will uh, be able to do that. That's funny. <laughs> there you go. How did you, find that? How did you How did you pull that off? <laughs> I just happened to see it. I that just is crazy. It What's it? That's, that's, that's somebody up high, man. That's amazing. So that's shout amazing. out to both so you guys. Everybody you checking it out. watching this, if you haven't done so yet, please hit the thumbs up and please consider sharing this video on your social media because there are people out there. And for people in the keto carnivore community, we're, we're kind of living in a, a bubble. We think everybody knows about keto carnivore by this point, surely, my goodness. But I'm here to tell you 85 to 90% of the people in the average town, city, burg, wide spot in the road, they've, they've either never, they've definitely never heard of carnivore. And they probably the only thing they've heard about keto was, oh, it's dangerous. It's even keto butt crack or something. I read it or I saw a thing on TV. It's bad. Somehow it's bad. I don't know. That's all they know. And please share this video. If you know someone, you can send it in an email, a text message. You can hit the share button. You can send it to whoever needs to see it. But that's how Dr. Hampton and I, that's how we help people that we've never met before. That's how Carlos and his wife found Dr. Hampton was watching my video and said, hey, there's, hey, oh my God, he's in Chicago. Boom, we're going to see him. That's right. Somebody shared that video and then they saw that video right. and now they've got a primary care doctor who understands a proper human diet. I know you guys sometimes think, Sharon don't help nothing. That ain't what you know. Yeah, you can literally save somebody's life by hitting the share button right now. So please, if you haven't, please do that. Doc, as we wrap up, let's pretend we got somebody that just tuned in. And they're like, well, these guys are both doctors. So Dr. Tony and Ken Perry and D. They both look pretty fit and healthy. They sound like they know what they're talking about, but I don't know nothing about keto or carnivore. 
I wouldn't even know how to begin. Let's walk That's them right. through step one, step two, step three. What do we need to get rid of? What do we need to eat more of in order to, to enjoy all the benefits that come from being a proper eater? Yeah, it's a, it's actually a, a beautiful question because it's so easy. We're we're starting a new year right now, and the yep. first thing you want to do is you know define what your goal is, and and let's just say your goal is to be healthy. That's too vague, right? right. Let's be very specific. So it may mean I want to have knees that don't hurt me so that I can get on the knees with my grandbabies and play with them or my great grandbabies. That's number yeah. one. The, the next thing you want to do is think about who can support you. So it doesn't have to be a family member. It doesn't have to be a friend. It could be uh, maybe you buy it yourself a coach, but you need support. And, and that support is a resource that will be huge for you. And, and then the last thing before I say anything about diet is think about being comfortable with non-scale victories, right? And, and thanks, Nurse Kim. It's good to see her with us today. Um, listen, non-scale victories are huge because when I talked about the things that determine your success for metabolic health, I did mention the belly fat, right? Well, that's a non-scale victory. Is my belly shrinking? Is the belt fitting a little looser? I, I literally, you know, I can't even afford to buy another belt because I kind of keep making holes in it. That's a non-scale victory. So yes. you kind of start there as you start your new year. Write your goals down. You have to write your goals down. Make sure your goals align with your purpose. I'm the metabolic health doc. That's my purpose. Find out what your purpose is. But this is the fun part. When you're doing a ketovore or carnivore diet, you're eating animals. <laughs> so so this is very simple. We don't add barbecue sauce or cornmeal or, or flour to our animals. That's going to mess it up. And literally uh, a chicken breast with flour on it is 16 carbs divided by four is four teaspoons of sugar. A yep. baked or grilled chicken breast without that is zero carbs. So you eat your animals without garbage added to it. Number two, you eat non-starchy vegetables. So it's okay to eat, and you need to know your numbers. So if I eat green beans, I already know it's about seven carbs per serving. If I eat broccoli, I already know it's 10 carbs per serving. I need you to know those numbers so that when you're out and about, you'll know what the numbers are. And by the way, I, we visited Red Lobster in America, and they had Brussels sprouts. We did the biggest mistake you ever make. You don't assume the Brussels sprouts are the same. <laughs> so we get the Brussels sprouts. My wife said, man, this seems, seems kind of sweet. And and of course, with her being type one, her sugar goes, I was like, it's Brussels sprouts. We looked up Brussels sprouts, which we kind of knew already, but I said, let's look it up. It was about, what, seven carbs per serving. Well, yep. Red Lobster's Brussels sprouts was 40 plus carbs per serving. So trust, but verify, know what yep. foods are the better foods. And so, so, and then if you're, and if you're, uh, if you're, if you're going to eat fruit, it better be berries. And I would, and I would consider even berries, uh, nature's candy it's snack foods. So non-starchy vegetables, protein from any source you prefer, don't put the wrong stuff on it. And then you make a decision how far you want to go. Your body will tell you <clears throat> what to eat. And 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 you and if you want to keep it simple, you do, you know, salt, beef, eggs, and butter, right? But if you want to have fun with some other things like guacamole, you know, like a, a avocado, well, avocado probably won't bother you. So so you I would say clean it up, get as close to carnivore as possible. And then if you want to add back because you don't get irritated by these foods, that's okay. This is not a coat. This is not a my way or the highway. This is the best experiment you'll ever do on your body is the end of one. And your body knows way more about you than Dr. Barry or Dr. Hampton. So do that experiment. And if that leads you down the path of where you feel your best, that's the diet for you. And that's why I do have some plant-based people in my practice, but they have to micromanage the supplements and know what they're doing. Uh, but I see more people struggle with that dietary pattern. So if you want to get the biggest bang for the buck, eat the essential foods, fat and protein, instead of relying on the non-essential foods. And you have to be a freaking nutrition professional to figure out how to eat that way. Yep. I love that. My quick and easy steps are step one, remove all sugar from your diet. Definitely added sugar, but most of the natural sugar as well. Number two, 
remove all grain from your diet. Wheat, yeah. rice, oats, corn, rye, millet, quinoa, super yeah. high in carbohydrates. Number three, remove all vegetable seed oils from your diet completely. Yeah. Canola oil, soybean oil, peanuts, sunflower, sapphire, remove them all. Cook with animal fat. Step number four, yeah. cover at least half of your plate with fatty red meat and eggs with the yolk. If you want to cover the whole plate, huzzah. If you just want to have half your plate covered with fatty red meat and eggs with the yolk and then half your plate covered with low-carb, non-starchy veg, and i got a video on YouTube. That's if right. You, if you're like, I don't know what the non-starchy vegetable is, uh, look up Keto-Friendly Vegetables, Dr. Barry. You will find the video. Yeah. And then repeat. That's it. Eat when you're hungry. Eat until you're full. Then go outside yeah. and play. Hang out with your family. Interact with humans, have a relationships with people, get good sleep, go out in the morning, let the sun shine on your face, stand barefoot in the grass five minutes a day, little stuff like that. And by the end of that 90 days, now I can really make it even more simple. Beef, butter, bacon, and eggs, triple right. B and E. That's it. And, and the same rule applies. You don't track, measure, weigh, none of that. If you're hungry, you eat, you eat till you're full, stop eating, go outside and play. When you get hungry again, repeat. That's it. Beef, butter, That's bacon, it. and eggs. That's how simple it can be. With that simple diet that you're not restricting calories and portion size, you can reverse type 2 diabetes. You can reverse hypertension. You can reverse fatty liver. You can improve your mental health. Multiple different mental health issues get much better or resolve completely. Many skin conditions get better or resolve completely on that simple diet that you're never hungry for. Many gastrointestinal conditions go completely away on that simple diet where you're never hungry. Yeah. That's that's the beauty and the simplicity of this, plus it's ancestrally appropriate. Dr. Hampton, thank yeah. you so much. I can't wait to speak to you and that beautiful wife on the farm. Uh, Lisa and I were just talking about two days ago about coming back to the Windy City because we missed the museum. We missed that hotel we honeymooned in. And we, we still feel like we're on our honeymoon, but we wouldn't mind going back to that hotel one more time. So if you guys will have us one of these days in the near future, we're going to come to Chicago and we're going to hang out and have a steak together. Looking forward to that. And you you definitely give her a hug for me and my wife and uh, those beautiful kids. And I'll do the same for you, man. This is what it's all about, living our purpose, helping people heal. And, and for everybody checking us out, please uh, continue to stay inspired. There's no better time of the year to make change than now. And if other people can do it, you can do it. So let's, let's make this happen. And I can't wait to hear testimonials. Uh, Ingrid and Carlos will probably be guests on one of our channels in the near future, celebrating their success as well. So thank you guys for having me today. Thanks a lot, Doc. See you next.